I am a police officer in South Jersey, and I've been serving in this capacity since I was 23 years old. While some might think it's an exhilarating job, the reality is that it's not as thrilling as it's often portrayed. My county experiences minimal incidents, mainly revolving around disturbance calls or the occasional shoplifting, with more serious cases sprinkled in very rarely. Over the years, I've worked various shifts, including night duty, which has its fair share of peculiar calls compared to the day shift. One particular night shift stands out in my memory when something unusual happened. I remember cruising along a quiet road, enveloped by darkness as there were no street lights, and thick woods flanked both sides of the road. Suddenly, I spotted the reflection of taillights on the right side of the road, and as I approached, I noticed the driver's side door was ajar. I decided to veer onto the grass and slow down, intending to offer assistance to the driver. However, upon getting closer, I was surprised to see someone stepping out of the car. They lingered by the door for a moment before bolting into the woods. Concerned, I immediately called in for a suspicious person or vehicle, and with my flashlight in hand and hand on my holster, I cautiously stepped out of the car. I proceeded towards the abandoned vehicle and peered inside, half expecting to find someone else there. Strangely, the car appeared empty, but an unbearable foul smell, reminiscent of rotting flesh, emanated from within. I called out into the woods, asking if anyone needed help while shining my flashlight around. I heard footsteps in response, but despite my warnings, nobody came forward. The situation was growing more ominous, and I couldn't shake off a sense of danger. After requesting backup, I continued investigating the car. It lacked license plates, and upon examining the passenger side, I discovered bloody tissues and paper towels soaked in blood. The rear seats were equally gruesome. My suspicions intensified when I heard a deep voice coming from the woods, but the words were indecipherable. I demanded the person to reveal themselves, and if they needed assistance, but there was no response. The situation was far from normal. As I ventured back towards the car, I noticed something wrapped in bloody paper towels. With gloved hands, I carefully unwrapped it, only to be met with a horrifying sight, a severed hand, dark red from blood. I immediately radioed for a possible murder, urgently calling for backup. With my cruiser's lights on to help identify my location, we conducted a thorough search of the woods, but found no blood trails or any indication of a wounded person. Despite the extensive efforts the canine unit included, we couldn't find the individual. To make matters more puzzling, the vehicle was reported stolen by someone from a nearby town, who had no idea who might have taken it. Fingerprints and DNA testing on the severed hand yielded no matches in any database. To this day, the case remains unsolved, leaving me haunted by the memory of that enigmatic night and the unanswered questions surrounding the driver's identity and the severed hand's origin. One night, my partner and I received an assignment at the sheriff's department to handle tethers or ankle monitors. Our task was to locate a person who had absconded from the program. We tracked the individual's last known location to a rather shady area in the county. From the outset, this particular stop felt different from routine ones. As my partner approached the front door, I positioned myself on the side of the house, keeping a watchful eye on both him and the side of the building. When we knocked on the door, we heard movement from inside. A middle-aged woman cautiously peered out at us, and to my surprise, her gaze was fixed directly on me. I wasn't visible from any window at the front or side of the house, making it rather unusual that she would look in my direction first instead of addressing the person at the front door. After some hesitation, she let us in and we inquired if she knew the whereabouts of the person we were searching for, Camille. In a somewhat mumbled response, it seemed like she was familiar with Camille and that she might have been a caretaker of sorts. The whole situation struck us as off, especially when she suddenly dropped to her hands and knees and began scooting on the floor, calling out for Camille. It became evident that the woman was dealing with mental health issues, adding to the unsettling atmosphere. 
Nevertheless, we proceeded with our search of the house. Throughout the process, she continued to follow us on the ground, never getting back on her feet and repeatedly calling for Camille. It was around 8 p.m., and darkness had set in outside. The interior of the house had minimal lighting, lacking modern electronics or TVs, which only added to the eerie feeling. The layout of the old-style house, with its four bedrooms and two floors, played tricks on my perception. Every time I left a room, it seemed like I entered a part of the house I had not been in before, almost like crossing into a different dimension. The woman would occasionally appear right behind me, silently, leaving me puzzled about the plausibility of it all. At one point, we ventured upstairs, expecting to find more bedrooms or a bathroom. However, the door leading upstairs appeared strangely sealed, as if it had been painted over with dried paint in the seams. Eventually, we managed to open the door, only to discover an attic-like space filled with insulation and storage items, reminiscent of a scene from paranormal activity. After what felt like an extended period of searching, we decided to call off the search and clear the property. As we left, the woman stood at the door, fixating her gaze on us. Strangely enough, when we later checked the time, we realized we had only been there for 20 minutes, although it felt like an hour or two. The whole experience was deeply unsettling, from the late night setting to the woman's peculiar behavior, the stealth with which she appeared behind me, and her unnerving stare as we departed. Needless to say, we never returned to that house again. In the middle of Georgia, my family and I resided in an area where stories seldom emerge. I want to share one such story that left us grateful for the rarity of such occurrences. My cousin, whom we all called Bob, had been a police officer for five years. When he joined the force, he was full of enthusiasm and optimism, driven by the sincere desire to make a positive impact and improve the lives of people in his community. One day, an alert led them to a seemingly abandoned house somewhere between Macon and Roberta. The condition of the house reflected years of neglect. Upon arrival, they encountered an elderly man sitting on the front steps, his face stained with tears. Bob and his fellow officer approached the man with concern, but it quickly became apparent that the gentleman was incoherent and deeply traumatized. Realizing the man needed assistance, they called for backup. With tensions rising, Bob made the decision to enter the house, where a foul odor overwhelmed him. The kitchen and living room were in shambles, a clear indication of hoarding, with pots and pans piled nearly to the ceiling and spoiled food strewn across the table. As he proceeded, calling out for any response, silence greeted him. Despite his extensive training and experience, Bob felt his heart rate quicken, his gun at the ready. The living room yielded no results, and as he moved down the hallway, the stench grew unbearable. With his hand covering his nose and mouth, he mustered the courage to open what he suspected to be the bedroom door. There, he encountered a sight that would haunt him forever. Lying on the bed were two lifeless bodies, their skin gray and infested with flies. A male and a female, their faces already decaying, presented a horrifying scene. To his utter shock, he discovered that the woman clutched a deceased infant in her arms. The gravity of the situation intensified when a cockroach emerged from the lifeless baby's mouth. Overwhelmed by disgust, Bob rushed outside, stumbling over himself and emptying his stomach on the steps where the old man had been sitting earlier. As backup arrived, they conducted a thorough investigation. The older man turned out to be a former co-worker and friend of the deceased couple, having worked together at a peach packing company. He had visited their home after not hearing from them for over a week and was the first to witness the devastating scene in the bedroom. The assembled story unveiled a tragic sequence of events. The husband and wife had developed an opioid addiction following some medical procedure a year earlier. Gradually, their reliance on painkillers led to heroin abuse. Tragically, their neglect resulted in the death of their young daughter. Consumed by grief and despair, they ultimately chose to end their lives, leaving behind a horrifying tableau for Bob to encounter. 
The coroner's report revealed lethal amounts of heroin in both their bodies. Despite his continued service on the force, Bob found himself struggling with the aftermath of this haunting experience. He turned to therapy and has made progress in controlling his drinking, but the memories of the lifeless child continue to plague him, even in his nightmares, where the baby's cries persist. Once, I received a distress call reporting a possible breaking and entering at the residence of a young woman who lived alone. Fearful and shaken, she explained that upon returning home, she discovered a broken window downstairs. While nothing appeared stolen, she sensed a presence and heard what seemed like footsteps moving around downstairs. The call abruptly disconnected, and subsequent attempts to reach her were unsuccessful. I immediately responded to the call and arrived at the small house. Approaching the front door, I knocked, but there was no response. After several more attempts to make contact, I decided to inspect the premises. I noticed a broken window large enough for someone to crawl through with ease. Peering into the darkness, I identified myself as a police officer, but silence greeted my announcement. Concerned for the potential safety of anyone inside, I radioed dispatch, indicating the need for backup. However, I couldn't afford to wait for additional officers and decided to enter the house through the broken window. Carefully, I navigated through the kitchen, announcing my presence loudly. With gun drawn, I continued through the house, treading carefully to avoid causing undue alarm. The woman on the phone had mentioned hearing footsteps downstairs, suggesting that her bedroom was upstairs. Following the voice, I eventually found her in one of the bedrooms, sitting up in bed under the covers. After confirming that she was physically unharmed, I inquired about her abrupt disconnection and refusal to pick up subsequent calls. Sensing her distress, I gestured subtly towards the closet, but she indicated that nobody was hiding there. However, when I pointed under the bed, she confirmed that the intruder was indeed there. Now aware of the situation, I improvised a plan. Calmly, I told her that I needed her to sign a report form stating that my visit had not uncovered anything unusual. She complied, and as she approached me, I discreetly pushed her out of the room. Swiftly drawing my weapon, I commanded the intruder to reveal himself. A tense moment followed as a dark figure emerged from under the bed, keeping his hands raised. I ordered him to drop any weapons, and he complied, letting a gun fall to the floor. I promptly arrested the middle-aged man, dressed in all black, and brought him outside, where additional officers were arriving. It later became evident that the woman had hung up the phone when she thought she heard the intruder upstairs, fearing he might hear the call's audio. Similarly, she refrained from answering subsequent calls as the intruder had entered her room, threatening her with a gun, and warned her against making any noise when the police arrived. I'm grateful that I was able to discern the situation quickly, as it could have easily turned dangerous had I not acted promptly. 